Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Preeti Sharma and I'm an educator on the platform of Anne Academy. Welcome to the next YouTube session and as we had discussed yesterday in continuity with the same we are going to discuss another set of mixed bag questions that we have planned for today and this is going to be helpful for every exam pattern that uh, you know you are um, sitting for be it the NEET PG or the FMG and before I begin I just wanted to remind you about the free test which is going to be conducted on the Unacademy app uh, in the coming week that is on 2nd of February there's a test which I have prepared of 30 questions which has been curated by me and also once you attempt these 30 questions not only will you get an overall ranking but also you'll get a written solution to the 30 questions so hoping and looking forward to seeing you attempting this test as well after that on 4th of february there is a similar test which will be conducted at 10 o'clock uh, comprising of 20 questions which has been curated by uh, uh, you know dr cheshta and that will also be conducted on the youtube channel so these are the things that you should look out for coming week and let's begin now with the mixed bag of questions that we have so the first question is a question which certainly has gained a lot of uh, importance in the past one year because this particular topic is being asked more. So a dot like paranuclear positivity is noted with which of the following tumors? Hepatocellular carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, Merkel cell or colon cancer. So when they say paranuclear dot like positivity, the answer to the question is Merkel cell carcinoma. And this positivity of what are they talking about? They are talking about CK20 positivity. So I think everyone has heard of this very famous topic regarding the CK720 profile, which they are... Um, you know now asking you a lot in the exam so i'll take you through the entire table which is important for all of you to know and this is the table where different different ck20 variations can be sought first and foremost when i talk about ck7 ck stands for cytokeratin i hope everyone remembers that it's an intermediate filament cytokeratin when i say ck7 and ck20 both are positive when I'm saying that I'm seeing the expression of both, that is very commonly seen in association with bladder cancer. So when both are positive, I'll think about bladder cancer, that is urothelial carcinoma that I can see over here. There are certain tumors which I'm going to highlight in this entire table because those are the ones which you get maximum questions from. After that, we come to the next variety where both are negative, 7 negative and 20 negative, which I call as all the CC tumors. What do I mean by that? Hepatocellular carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, small cell carcinoma. All of these, so hepatocellular carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, small cell carcinoma, all of these, the CC ones are going to be negative. Now I'm left with two variations. I'm left with only and only 7 positive and only and only 20 positive. So only 7 positive, only 20 positive. Only 7 positive is learned by two techniques. First, you have to remember that not all but majority of the female related tumors. For example, if I say breast cancer, more predominant in female, thyroid cancer, more in female, endometrial cancer is a female tumor, cervical cancer is a female tumor. So these female related tumors tend to be CK7 positive. Apart from that, all the organs which fall above the colorectal region, above the colon, the organs which come. So for example, lung cancer definitely above the colon, salivary gland, ho gaya, thyroid again, uh, bile duct that is cholangiocarcinoma, pancreatic carcinoma. So everything above the colorectal region, that also tends to be CK7 positive. So for 7 positive, remember, not all but majority of the female tumors and tumors which are above the colon that are mentioned whereas CK20 positive are only two tumors below the colorectal so colorectal and below that comes out to be CK20 positive and Merkel cell carcinoma so remember CM20 CK20 are going to be colorectal and Merkel cell carcinoma of which I had asked you a question of Merkel cell carcinoma. I hope all of you recall and are able to remember that Merkel cell carcinoma is basically a type of a neuroendocrine tumor. 
So it definitely shows me all the neuroendocrine markers. But when I talk about its CK7 profile, CK7 is not going to be there. CK20 is going to be there in what kind of a pattern? So for example, if this is a cell, I'll see that CK20 comes like a dot pattern next to the nucleus. Dot like next to the nucleus, paranuclear positivity of CK20 makes it a diagnosis of Merkel cell carcinoma. So quick recap, when both are positive, I'm dealing with bladder. For only 7, I'm dealing with female and above colon tumors. For only 20, I have colorectal and Merkel cell. And both negative, I have all the CC tumors, RCC, HCC, squamous cell and small cell carcinoma. Having said that, let's move on to the next set of questions, which happens to be this. So this is one of the very few numericals that we actually have in pathology, but especially it used to be a name's favorite once upon a time. So 44 year old male presents with a hemoglobin of 5 gram and the reticulocyte count has come out to be 6%. So they've asked you the corrected retic count. Whenever we are dealing with cases of severe anemia, we want to calculate this corrected retic count. We want to correct the retic count that has been given because the retic count might be coming, uh, you know, higher than expected or higher than what it should be. So am I dealing with a case of severe anemia? Definitely, yes. Hemoglobin is 5, less than 7. So it is a case of severe anemia. So I'll write down the things provided to me. Hemoglobin given to me is 5 grams, whereas the reticulocyte count that is given to me is 6 percent and I have to find out the corrected retic count. So what is the formula that I have for corrected retic count? Corrected retic count is reticulocyte multiplied by hemoglobin of the patient that has been given to me divided by the hemoglobin which should ideally be in this case. So ideally for uh, a 44 year old male, adult male, I'll take an average of 15, right? So I'll take this value to be 15. So for reticulocyte, they've given me 6 multiplied by hemoglobin of the patient, they've given me 5 divided by hemoglobin of a normal person, I'm going to consider it as 15. So very clearly the answer over here comes out to be a 2% and that is what was the scenario. So 2% is the answer. That is one way of calculating the corrected retic count. Retic count multiplied by hemoglobin of patient divided by hemoglobin of normal. If for example, instead of the hemoglobin, the hematocrit was given. It's the same thing. I think everyone remembers a basic hematology formula that if I multiply the hemoglobin by 3, I always get the hematocrit. Or hematocrit is also known as packed cell volume, right? So you multiply the hemoglobin by 3, you'll get hematocrit. For example, in a normal person, if I'm saying the hemoglobin is 15, then in a normal person, the hematocrit is roughly 45%. So it's always in a multiple of 3 that I find it. So hemoglobin into 3 is hematocrit. So for example, if the examiner would have given me hematocrit, I would have done hematocrit of the patient that would be given divided by normal hematocrit that is 45. So either of the two ways you can use for calculating the corrected retic count. Let's move on to the next question. Now moving on over here, I have, let's read it together. I have a patient who's presented to the OPD with hematuria. And histopathology has shown mesangial widening and endocapillary proliferation. Mesangial widening is there. Electron microscopy shows deposits predominantly in the mesangium. What is your diagnosis? So firstly, I have to categorize. I've seen a lot of disorders written in front of me. So good pasture, IgA nephropathy, MPGN, chronic, some are nephrotic, some are nephritic. So whenever I'm dealing with a case of hematuria, my first, uh, you know, thought process goes in favor of a nephritic syndrome. More common, I would think of a nephritic syndrome. Okay, so amongst the nephritic, I am talking about something that is depositing again and again in the mesangium. And that particular disorder which characteristically shows me the mesangial deposition is going to be IgA nephropathy. So I think everyone knows that IgA nephropathy also carries another name. In the kidney, it is also known as Berger's disease. IgA nephropathy also known as Berger's disease. So where does this IgA deposit? IgA tends to deposit within the mesangium. So first let's draw and understand what exactly is the mesangium. Then we'll see a picture also. So for example, if this is a glomerulus and all of us know that this would be the tuft of capillaries that a glomerulus has, right? These are the capillary tuft. 
what is mesangium mesangium is the space in between mesangium is going to be the space in between so we'll highlight it like this all these spaces in between these are known as the mesangium so i can say that all the iga that i'm talking about is going to deposit in this area all the iga will deposit in this area let me have a look at it on the microscopy with immunofluorescence so when i'm dealing with a case of immunofluorescence i saw the fluorescent color but i'll have to imagine a little so imagine these to be the capillary loops and you will actually realize that yes the capillary loops uh, in between area is coming out to be green because iga is depositing in the mesangium so i think now when i put everything together mesangial deposition in a nephritic syndrome i'll definitely go in for iga nephropathy okay what should have been mentioned for good pasture syndrome for good pasture syndrome i usually have on immunofluorescence we have a linear deposit we have a linear deposit and that was not seen in this case so definitely not a good pasture syndrome right okay moving on to the next you have a particular slide in front of you and they want you to identify the blood group out here there are four possibilities and they've given you all four but they over here they're not labeled so i label it for you for example this is with anti a this is with anti b and this is with anti d so when i give you this kind of a labeling i think everyone is able to identify where is the clumping seen the clumping is seen here and the clumping is seen here so this is a classical b positive blood group so this is the labeling that i've done on my own why did the examiner not give me a labeling because examiner wanted you to interpret it the way i interpreted it because all these sera are anti coded are uh, these are color coded all these anti sera they are color coded for example why did i call this anti a why did i call this anti b and this anti d because these sera have a color coding known as big i've learnt it as big which means anti a sera is going to be blue in color anti b sera is going to be yellow in color anti d is either going to be gray or colorless anti d is going to be gray or colorless so i've remembered it as big mnemonic anti a blue anti b yellow anti d gray so let us have a look at it so for example again remember blue yellow green so this blue one that i see the blue one is anti a then the yellow one that i see the yellow one is anti b then when i see the gray wala the gray wala gray cap one that is going to be anti d so please remember a b and d i see a couple of other roles so i see this greenish color solution this green color solution is anti human globulin and this is the homework every day i've been giving you one homework so yesterday if you remember i gave you a homework on pass staining which all of you commented and i saw that i liked all your comments which were the right ones and i am genuinely looking out for this answer as well in which test in blood banking will i use this green color solution that is anti human globulin so please type out and let me know the only purpose of this is that if you know the answer well and good if you don't know the answer at least you learn something from the comments so you'll get back to the book and read about it and that's the purpose of giving you these homeworks well so over here now i think blue yellow uh, and colorless i know the color coding i saw the clumping here and i saw the clumping here so this was a classical b positive blood group that i had well having said that let's move on to the next question there's a particular machine quite a famous one in 2020 and 2021 uh this was quite the hype and what is this machine known as so this machine with this screen a lot of controls and bags hanging over here this is said to be an apheresis machine what is the technique and how do i uh, you know what exactly am i wanting to find out about an apheresis machine is this so what do i do this is my apheresis donor what do i want from him for example why did i say this was quite a hype in the uh, last two years because when we were when we are dealing with earlier it was a protocol now it's not but they were saying people who had recovered from covid they obviously had antibodies in them and they were taking these antibodies and they were using it for the treatment of other patients so basically they said that people who had recovered from covid unka antibodies we should take 
and how should we take the antibodies we should basically do a plasma apheresis we should do a plasma apheresis means from this donor who is recovered from covid i'll only require the plasma because plasma will have antibodies i don't need his red blood cells i don't need his platelets i only need his plasma because i need his antibodies so what would happen this is your apheresis machine you are going to call the donor you are going to first withdraw the blood the blood is going to and this happens all simultaneously the blood is withdrawn it goes into this machine it is divided into components rbc will become separate platelet will become separate plasma will become separate whatever component you want to keep you say that ma'am in my blood bank i need plasma right now because i need antibodies you keep this in your blood bank you are going to retain this you are going to retain this but there's no point keeping red blood cell and platelet that you don't need so the unused components are then returned to the donor bank so whatever is needed that is kept whatever is not needed that is returned let me give you another example for example you are in a hospital and there's an outbreak of dengue every year it happens or alternate year it happens where the demand of platelets is very very high so then from all these donors what do you need you are only interested in platelet so what do you do then in that case you do platelet apheresis this means when the patient when this donor will come to you you will take his blood you will only and only keep the platelets in your blood bank and the rbc and plasma you will return it back so depending on whatever is the need you do the apheresis according to that and that is why can you see the bags are hanging and there's an entire machine that is functioning so that is the apheresis machine that you have to know about well let's move on to the next question guys and here you go there's a 19 year old boy who's presented with an osteolytic lesion in the right lower tibia the ct and gross specimen are shown i can see an osteolytic lesion in the right lower tibia and when the gross specimen was removed when i opened it uh, this def definitely i can see that when i've opened it it's cystic and it's full of blood now i just want to tell you that this case actually this gross specimen i've taken it directly from uh, when i was a resident uh, this was a case that we received so this is uh, one of the real time pictures that i've got for you this is not from any textbook but yeah this was quite a classical case because we received such a cystic bony lesion we removed we you know cut the bone we cut open the bone and the bone was entirely filled with lots of blood exactly how it's seen over here so when we called for the radiological findings we were told that there was an osteolytic lesion and that is explaining the cyst cavity and the blood microscopically also we saw that there were large blood filled spaces and along with that there were giant cells so which of the following genetic alterations do you see so first you'll have to make a diagnosis only then you'll be able to make a genetic alteration to it and the diagnosis is aneurysmal bone cyst abc so now that kind of explains the entire situation aneurysmal aneurysm means dilated channels that is why i'm going to see large blood filled spaces and along with that i see giant cells further this is a bone cyst it's not a tumor as such it's a tumor like condition aneurysmal bone cyst that is why i'm seeing a cystic area i'm seeing osteolytic lesions and abc aneurysmal bone cyst is very famous for showing me usp 6 gene rearrangements now before i move ahead i have a lot of things to discuss in this question so this is aneurysmal bone cyst the story ends over here but i want you to now tell me what are all the things which can show me usp6 gene rearrangements so this is another question that can come to you in the exam usp6 gene is learned by a very famous mnemonic which we've done earlier in our an academy classes and that is manu which is u stands for the usp6 M stands for myositis ossificans. Myositis ossificans is the first one. Second is what I just taught you, aneurysmal bone cyst, and third is what I taught you was nodular fasciitis. Nodular fasciitis also shows you USP six gene rearrangements. Repeating, myositis ossificans M, then aneurysmal bone cyst. nodular fasciitis and these show you usp6 gene rearrangements so now the entire question is complete there are a couple of other options also given to you let's decode them also let's take up a separate slide and go in for them translocation 1122 i think everyone is quite evident very clear about it e and s 
Ewing sarcoma. So in yesterday's class, only I have taught you this tumor in yesterday's YouTube session. So E will remind you of 11. S, if you flip it, you get a 22. So translocation 1122, Ewing sarcoma. 1722 is a skin and soft tissue tumor. Dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. Dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. The word tells you dermatofibros. It's a skin soft tissue tumor. Sarcoma because it's a cancer. Protuberance because it protrudes above the skin. Dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. Coming to the last one, IDH mutation. Since we are talking about bone tumors, first I'll definitely want to ask you which bone tumor can show you this IDH mutation. IDH, I hope everyone remembers, IDH is something that stands for an enzyme. Isocitrate dehydrogenase. So I'm talking about the mutation of isocitrate dehydrogenase. So when I'm categorizing it under bone tumors, chondromas tend to show me this mutation. Chondromas or n chondromas, basically cartilaginous tumors show me IDH mutation. When I'm talking about brain tumors, there are two brain tumors that show me the same, and that is going to be the glioblastoma. One is going to be glioblastoma and the other is going to be oligodendroglioma. So all in all, now this question I feel is complete. IDH mutations done, USP6 gene rearrangements done and the rest of the mutations also finished. Let's move on to the next question now. Moving on to a little bit of hemat. So there are two questions. This is the first question that I want to ask you. If I give you this, what would you call this cell? Metamylocyte, myelocyte, metamylocyte, promyelocyte or stab form. This particular cell, that's question one. And if I give you the same options and I ask you what is this cell, and then you need to answer both. So the first cell, I hope everyone was able to get. The first cell was a metamylocyte. And the second cell that I have over here is a band form or a stab form. So we need to understand all the lineages that we have for the granular cells. When I mean granular cells, I'm talking about three cells. I'm talking about neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. These are the three cells which have granules. Like over here, I think everyone recognizes this cell. This is a neutrophil. But similar to neutrophil, how is a neutrophil formed? In the same manner, an eosinophil is also formed. In the same manner, a basophil is also formed. So these are the cells which are very nicely referred to as granulocytes because they all have granules. And their formation is the same. So let's understand the formation. The first cell, I think everyone will identify which has these rods in it. Everyone can characteristically see the all rods and anything that has an all rod becomes a myeloblast. So the first cell of the lineage is a blast. It is a myeloblast. After this comes the next, the next cell and that is one of the largest in this entire series. The largest cell that we have is a pro. It's a pro cell. It's the largest cell and that is promyelocyte. The largest is promyelocyte. After that, in the next cell, you remove the pro. You are only left with myelocyte. You are only left with myelocyte. And please remember MD. How will I identify myelocyte? Myelocyte has a D-shaped nucleus. Look at the shape of the nucleus, guys. The shape of the nucleus is a D-shape. So MD, that is what you are here for, right? MD karna hai. So myelocyte is the D-shaped nucleus. After this comes the next stage. And if I look at the nucleus now, it's got an indentation like this, a tiny indentation. So it's looking like an M, right? The nucleus has started looking like an M. So the name of this cell is MM. That is now we call it a metamylocyte. That is how you will remember the names also and the nuclei also. When the nucleus is D, you call it a myelocyte, MD. When it is M, M, when it's looking like an M, you call it a metamylocyte. Coming to the next stage, in the next stage, the indentation is very, very deep. It started looking like a hairband. Now it started looking like a hairband. So now you're going to either call it a band form or you can also call it a stab form band form or stab form and finally comes the last stage where you got a neutrophil. Similarly, instead of a neutrophil, an EO could have been formed or a baso could have been formed. So first and foremost, the first cell is a blast. Then comes the biggest pro cell, which is promyelocyte. 
then comes the d shaped nucleus which is myelocyte then comes the m shaped nucleus which is the way you write it metamyelocyte then comes a hairband looking nucleus that is the band or the stab form and then either of the three granulocytes so a very valid question comes to my mind that at what stage is it decided that this lineage will give rise to a neutro or an eo or a baso so i want to ask you what is the life changing event in your career the life changing event will be cracking your neat pg and getting into md right getting into md ms is your life changing event so here also this md ms is life changing event so i'll put a big star over here it is at this stage it is at this stage that it is decided that the granules that will come will be of a neutrophil or the granules will be of an eosinophil or the granules will be of a basophil so at this stage suddenly if you start seeing some orangish granules you know that yeah orange granules are there this means this is later on going to form an eosinophil so md is the deciding point at which the lineage decides later on which kind of cell is it going to form so when i had asked you this question now i hope this question is simple here you have a nucleus which is looking like an m so this is going to be mm this is a metamyelocyte whereas here you have a nucleus which is looking like a hair band so you're going to call this the band or the stab form having said that now let's move on to the next question and this is it which of the following are not well stained with romanovsky stain they are not well stained is what they are asking options are hovel jolly bodies heinz bodies caborings or you feel all are well stained pucha hai to there must be an answer to it which of the following is not well stained answer is going to be the heinz bodies so first and foremost uh, let's finish off our theory part of it when i'm talking about a heinz body i think everyone knows i see this in g6pd deficiency anemia why do i see this in g6pd deficiency anemia because when a person does not have g6pd that person cannot break down h2o2 h2o2 normally breaks into water and oxygen that is what happens in you and i because god has given us g6pd when the g6pd pathway will function h2o2 will break but when g6pd is deficient when there's a deficiency of g6pd the h2o2 will not break so can i say the levels of h2o2 will be very very high in the body and it's a damaging factor it's a free radical this means this is going to go and denature the hemoglobin this will denature the hemoglobin and once the hemoglobin is denatured look at how your cells look like if this is an rbc you will see that the hemoglobin is denatured so it's going to clump on one side the hemoglobin will clump like this and this denatured hemoglobin is referred to as the heinz body so if i ask you in a very simple one line that what is a heinz body you will say heinz body is nothing but a denatured hemoglobin seen because of h2o2 and seen in g6pd deficiency now comes the actual question can it be stained with the regular romanovsky stain no it cannot please remember heinz bodies are stained by a special stain called crystal violet heinz bodies are going to be stained not by romanovsky stain they are stained by crystal violet so i guess there's always a confusion regarding heinz bodies and hovel jolly bodies which we always wish to sort out and these are the three images which will help me sort it out also so talking about c uh, look at image number 1 over here it's got a pinkish color to it look at image number 2 this also has a pinkish color to it because in both of them the stain that i've used is the regular stain that is the romanovsky stain so in both picture number 1 and picture number 2 the regular stain has been used whereas look at picture number 3 it's looking a little dull it's not looking pinkish because here the stain that i've used is crystal violet so when i start seeing some bodies on crystal violet when you see these bluish bodies on crystal violet stain you know you're dealing with heinz bodies which is a denatured hemoglobin of g6pd deficiency versus when you see this pinkish color regular romanovsky stain either you will see cells with a single single body or you will see cells with multiple bodies when you are seeing single single body those are hovel jolly bodies and when you see multiple multiple dots those are pappenheimer bodies so you will always remember happy and jolly to be single happy and jolly when you are single right so single bodies are hovel jolly bodies and pappenheimer bodies are multiple when are they seen 
Pappenheimer bodies are made up of iron. So whenever there is an iron overload, I tend to see these bodies. For example, the sidroanemia, the iron overload anemia, sidroblastic anemia tends to show me the Pappenheimer bodies. Versus when I'm seeing hovel jolly bodies, one very famous anemia that is megaloblastic and also very common question of the exam, post splenectomy patients in their peripheral blood, they tend to show me hovel jolly bodies. Megal anemia and post splenectomy. What is hovel jolly made up of? It is made up of DNA remnants. Well, with that, this question also seems to end and what could not have been stained with Romanovsky stain was the Heinz bodies, which I'll stain with the help of crystal violet. Having said that, let's move on to the next question. It's a practical laboratory-based question that the following chemical is used for this step of histopathology processing. So what is this step and then what chemical is being used? So the answer to this question is DPX and what step is this? So I can see over here that there is a slide and there is some tissue on top of it and the tissue has a color. This means the tissue has already been stained. My usual pink and blue staining, the HME staining must have been done. But on top of this, I'm placing this squared like material. I'm basically placing a cover slip because I want, I don't want that the tissue should dry up, the stain should dry up, dust particles should stick onto it. I want to cover it with a cover slip so that I can look at it under the microscope. This process of covering a slide with a cover slip is referred to as mounting. But first learn the name. This process is referred to as mounting. But I will need a drop of some chemical or a glue which can stick the cover slip. And that glue that I use is DPX. So please remember, in earlier days, there was something known as Canada balsam that was used. This, you know, some old examiner might want to ask you in... Um, your viva questions in old days canada balsam was used but nowadays there is a sticky chemical known by the name of dpx there's a bottle of liquid dpx that comes it's like a transparent glue and that kind of helps in sticking the cover slip onto the tissue it has no impact on the tissue the tissue will not get hampered with it so remember for mounting now we have answer dpx having said that let's move on to the next question Okay, so over here, as I see, after the primary stain and the mordant has been added, but before the decolorizer has been used, gram-positive organisms are stained dash in color, gram-negative organisms are stained dash in color. So if you do not, you know, many a times in the exam, we have this habit of going in a retrospective manner where we read the last line and we give the diagnosis. See, uh, if I would have just read the last line, I would have said they're asking me gram positive is what in color, gram negative is what in color. And I think for gram staining, all of us know the interpretation that gram positive organisms are purple in color and gram negative organisms are pink in color. So I would have probably marked purple and pink. But that's not the answer. The answer to this question is purple and purple. Why do I say that? Let's see the first two lines. After the primary stain and the modern, they are talking about midway through the staining process. They are not talking about after the entire methodology is complete. So whenever I'm talking about a gram stain in microbiology, I think everyone knows the famous mnemonic come in and stain. That is the mnemonic that we have. So the first stain, the primary stain that I add is crystal violet. Crystal violet as the name suggests, whether it is a gram positive organism, whether it is a gram negative organism, everything becomes violet out here. When the first stain is added, everything is going to be violet. Either, either gram positive or gram negative, everything will be violet. Then I add iodine. What is iodine? Iodine is a mordant. Mordant is like a fixer. So it means that whatever purple color, crystal violet you had added, it will fix it further. So right now also both gram positive and gram negative organisms, both are still purple. Then I add alcohol. Alcohol is a decolorizer. Alcohol is a decolorizer means it's going to pull the color out, which means now only the gram positive organisms will remain purple, but the gram negative organisms will lose their color. They will become colorless. They will become colorless. So here there's a difference. Gram positive are purple and gram negative are colorless. So what color should I give to the gram negative organism? So now you put the secondary stain. 
on putting the secondary stain which is saffron in these gram negative which were colorless they will now become red and the gram positive were anyway purple so your end result is fine in the end your gram positive are purple gram positive are purple gram negative are red agreed but over here in the question they said after the primary stain and mordant has been added but before the decolorizer so they are splitting the staining methodology over here after the primary stain and the mordant has been added but before adding the decolorizer what is the color of the gram positive and the gram negative organisms both of them are purple in color at this stage so the answer to this question should be purple repeating the mnemonic was come in and stain so crystal violet iodine alcohol and saffronin crystal violet iodine alcohol saffronin that's the procedure the protocol that we have okay having said that uh, we are done with the set of questions that we have to discuss today so i guess we can wrap up a similar session will also be uploaded tomorrow and once all the sessions are done tomorrow i'll be uploading uh, the pdf of this particular class as well so yes what uh, i hope all of you are benefiting from it feedback is always welcome there's a tiny little homework also that i gave you which you are supposed to let me know in the comments below regarding this that is the anti-human globulin the green color one was used in which particular test of blood banking thank you guys for joining in and uh, see you tomorrow twice actually tomorrow morning we are back to the kickstart morning session so that happens on the unacademy app and in the evening i'll be uploading another uh, video on the youtube channel which will be a similar mixed bag session study well thanks for joining all the best